ஓம் ஸ்ரீ குருப்யோ நமக ஸ்ரீ கணேஷாய நமக ஆத்மஸ்வரூப அந்தகண ஸோ ஃபியூ கொஸ்டின்ஸ் நோ நத்திங் ஸ்பெஷல் டு மென்ஷன் அபவுட் மெடிடேஷன் இட் இஸ் கோயிங் ஆன் ஏதர் எஸ்டர்டேஸ் கிளாஸ் வில் ரிஃப்ளெக்ட் இன் டுடேஸ் மெடிடேஷன் ஆர் டுடேஸ் கிளாஸ் விச் இஸ் அபவுட் டு கம் will be reflected in meditation either that way this way <coughs> it don't be like that all the time but it could happen like that karma yoga one has proper viveka and vairagya is a duty beyond the gunas devoted to duty when you are devoted to duty you will go beyond the gunas duty is not beyond the gunas it is my duty means i am still in identification with the gunas therefore calling uh, having a a uh, self conscious i as a result of identification with the physical body and mind so in that situation the best way out of that bondage is be devoted to your duty in duty there is no attachment to the result that is how the duty is in india at one time they used to say i am going to duty at the same time in the west they used to say i am going to work at least expressions were like that so in the west wherever you find the country has developed now it's a developed country in all such countries you will find the people very much devoted to the work they are doing very devoted you find that like you can go to a post office in this country you can expect the best possible service from that person in the underdeveloped and developing countries the people are not devoted to their duties they don't do properly that's why they remain underdeveloped and underdeveloping this is why these countries have developed have become developed countries these comments i made now not that i am a great person or any such thing i made in the context of karma and other things these comments were made by swami vivekananda first and then by swami ramatirtha in very very emphatic terms you see i am a bit self unsure person and i make comments or assertions which i see very clearly like daylight and i sincerely feel that this point should be pursued or should be caught or should be taken up by the students i sincerely feel therefore i make those comments and then i compare my comments with some of the statements made by the mahatmas like ramatirtha vivekananda shri ram krishna paramahamsa and ram sukhadas ji maharaj aghandananda ji maharaj like that and i feel that i am doing quite all right that is how i feel if i start talking the way vivekananda talked or ramatirtha talked it will be even more uh, assertive therefore i feel like that then again i look at myself and the overall situation of the society of the country of the western culture 
and uh, how the societies are moving in the line of progress and all that when i look all, at all that then i become again self unsured oh i am making uh, unnecessarily i am sticking out my head why i am doing this like that i feel so i am always ambivalent about these things anyway i shared some of uh, one thing which was in my heart doesn't matter so as long as you say you are uh, doing a duty you are the actor you know therefore you are not out of the gunas when you clearly see what needs to be done gets done the, nat- the uh, even uh, i even i don't even say needs to be done because when you say this needs to be done there is an agenda in it i won't even say that i will say the natural thing happens naturally you need to breathe therefore you are breathing no true you need to breathe true but that is not the reason why you are breathing in fact you are not breathing and breathing is happening not because it is very much needed i suppose so i suppose it is happening in a very spontaneous way because that is what prakruti is the rishis their language is also very meaningful they said prakruti prakrushta kruti kruti is a uh, work pra intense that is what prakruti is so the organs are like that look at the heart the best example of prakruti it starts beating when i don't know maybe fourth month or fifth month of the fetus or maybe sixth month or seventh month seventh month or oh, seventh week amazing so starts beating at the seventh week and it is beating on and on and on 70 years 80 years 90 years and put a stent and put a pacemaker and do all those things and still it is beating are be kind to it if it wants to stop bless it why do you put a pacemaker and push it come on beat 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 why should it beat any more it was beating enough put a pacemaker and make it beat some more and then also it stops beating then hold it and do like this so that it will beat another one day what is that anyway <laughs> this is human mind is like that so i knew a mahatma he told me i love bp but at the same time i hate bp i love bp because it may lead to heart attack which leads to smooth and nice death i hate bp because it may lead to stroke and cause unbearable trouble that is how he is to say once i said to your mahatma such and such gentleman has a heart problem the mahatma immediately said god bless his soul what a blessed person he is because when you have heart problem the person who has heart problem will die without better being bedridden for any length of time so they are blessed so anyway all that is a digression and not digression also uh, so once you are no longer the actor as it is being said here no longer the actor then you are out of gunas it is not even uh, some high tech philosophy it is very practical thing nahang karta harish karta i am not the doer the lord is the doer that is called bhakti naham karta prakruti karta that is called jnanam same thing only the language is different thing is same that's why i say bhakti and the jnanam they are not two different things they appear start differently but merge into one anyway no longer desiring 
the results. Action with no will to act. Fine, we have covered all that points. And the question is not a pointed question. It is sounds like a statement, which is fine. And uh, so as long as you are an actor, as long as you consider something as your duty, you are still within the gunas. But it's all right. You are doing well. Likely to come out of the gunas. At least you are on the right path. Uh, symbolism of deity with two wives. What is the symbolism? It's a good question. Vishnu having two wives. That is the symbolism. What is the symbolism? One day I was in uh, the Vishnu temple in Aurora near Chicago. There is a big temple in Aurora. That is the town. Uh, near Chicago. Yeah. So I just uh, walked in and uh, going round. Exactly at the same time, an educational tour came there. <laughs> Some tw twelve or fifteen Americans, the local community people, and uh, ladies and gents, families, they came there. And uh, I also came, went there. Just like that I went. I did not inform anybody. Just like that I went. Like a devotee I went. I am a devotee. And uh, the management, uh, there will be some management there. They must have instructed one of the pujaris uh, to take this uh, group around the temple. Nice thing to do. Then the pujari took them to the main shrine. That is the Vishnu. Vishnu or Venkateshwara, one of the two, one and the same, kind of one and the same, there may be some differences I suppose. So, then uh, he is explaining, the Purohit is explaining. Before uh, I tell what the explanation he gave, let me also add this, that was the time when Clinton was going through impeachment trial. <laughs> there was an impeachment trial. I don't know what happened to it. It went. Uh, it was defeated. It was defeated or it was withdrawn. It was defeated, I think. So the trial was going on, and uh, the prosecutor was a, a big man in those days. He was the president of Pepperdine University of uh, Los Angeles. Some name is there. In those days, a famous name. His name used to appear every day in the first page of the New York Times. And uh, so that was the time. Whole country was uh, examining that issue with a lot of gusto. And uh, that lady's name was in everybody's uh, mind or on the lips. Uh, so <laughs> that was the time. General uh, time was that. And this group, and this Purohit, in a very majestic way. He is now, he is the guide, you know. Very, not like me. Not so much self-assured and all that. Not like me. Uh, he is very audacious in his uh, explanation. Should be like that. This is the main shrine. There are three things there. The, one of them asked who are the three, please explain. The middle one is the God, he said. Oh my God, then who are the other two sides? They are his wives. I was standing there. <laughs> I did not stand there to observe his explanation and their reaction. No, I don't do such things. It so happened that I was there. And I have eyes and ears also. Bhagavan gave, I don't know. There was no blood in their face. That to Clinton's thing it is, two wives. He, at least he should stop there. He adds, one when he is in Vaikuntha, that is the heaven, and one when he comes to the land, earth. <laughs> Can you believe it? Is that the way you look at these things? 
I wanted to shout, keep quiet, let me explain. But I did not do that. I should have done. Now I regret that I did not do it. Now I am telling you, it is not like that. Bhagavan doesn't marry, he is not like, he is not like humans marrying and all that. And the two marrying two ladies, what are, what are you talking? Vishnu stands for protection. Vishnu is the protector. In the Puranic language, Vishnu is the protector. Brahma, creator, Brahma, deva. Creator, Vishnu, protector. Rudra, annihilator. That is how it is described. Now, Vishnu protects. How does he protect? Suppose you want to protect certain population. How does you, pro- how do you protect? With wealth. And food. Food comes from earth. Bhumi. Wealth is Lakshmi. Therefore, he can protect. It is like a, a person can give you food. Only a sannyasi can get food. Not from a brahmachari. What brahmachari? I can get, I will get my food from grahasthas, from family people, married people. Similarly, the society can, can expects protection from the God. I mean, like from a married person. Therefore, God is visualized as though he is married. But then not regular marriage, like two ladies he got married, no. He is wedded to, like a student wedded to his studies. Like the king, like Narendra Modi wedded to his promise of protecting the country, like that. Like that the the protector or the Vishnu is wedded to wealth and earth. Earth for giving food, wealth for giving other things. Rudra need not be wedded to earth and uh, wealth because he is the annihilator. He is wedded to that uh, brute force which is in the form of time that puts an end to everything called Kali. Kalahasya hastiti Kali. Kali is Kali, one and the same. Therefore, it is indeed well said that Rudra is wedded to Kali, Vishnu is wedded to wealth and earth, because life is on earth only, nowhere else, as of now. That is the meaning. Bhudevi, Shri Devi. That is the meaning. Are you okay with that meaning? Now what we have done, ultimately what we have done, the spirit is lost. What I described is the spirit. The rishis were symbologists. That is the spirit. We lost it. We are stuck with the literally names and forms. Therefore, we have a God who is married to two women. It doesn't... I mean, I am telling my opinion. You examine it. You don't accept it for God's sake. You examine it. You think about it. We are... uh, accustomed to that idea from the childhood. We have inherited that thought pattern. So much so, it doesn't appear odd to us. Because we are accustomed to it. If you go to Tirupati, there is every day marriage function. Every day. Starts at 10 and ends at 12. Two hours marriage function. Every day. Marriage of God. With two. The regular marriage they do. If you go to a marriage function in a pandal, a young man marrying a young girl, what you see, the same thing in more elaborate way, in more uh, ostentatious way, you see there. Every day. No spirit, only letter is left. That is a bit unfortunate. Desires presuppose Ajnanam. 
we will come to it. Because desires means I, I, I tend to say in a particular direction. <laughs> so I will come to it. Symbolism behind Ganesha Murti. You see, I made an effort, I don't remember all of it now. I made an effort to make uh, uh, the symbolism of Ganesha clear with uh, certain authentic sources, uh, drawing from authentic sources. And I have put it in my book. So please refer to that, I don't remember. Ekadanta is Omkara, Advaita. Ekadanta, not Vedanta. He doesn't have two dantas. That is Advaita. Elephant head, means elephant. Elephant God. Sta elephant is the strongest and biggest animal in the forest. Among all animals it is the strongest. Stronger than a lion. It may be defeated by the lion, that is different, but a lion cannot face the elephant. Stronger than elephant, a lion, and the strongest, and also biggest, and yet vegetarian. That's why Bhagavan is the all, and uh, uh, all, all pervading, that is the biggest, and all powerful, strongest. Yet, protector, not destroyer. That is the symbolism of the elephant god, the elephant aspect of the god. One uh, thing is that, like that I have added a few more things to that. Like that you have to, I, I suggest, if you, get, if you find the book, you may read through it, you may find some more. Raja Dhirajaya Prayer is done to Ganesha while booklet points to Kubera. It is to Ganesha, it is not uh, Ganesha, it is Kubera only. Not even Kubera. Vaishravana Raja Dhirajaya Prasahya Sahine Namo Vayam Vaishravanaya Kurmahe Is that what it is? So Vayam Vai Vaishravanaya Vaishravana is the God. Devata, not Kubera. But then you may say the Purana, the Kubera of the Purana is the same as the Vaishravana of the Veda. You can say that. Therefore, it is not exactly Kubera, it is exactly Vaishravana. Which Devata can be related to the Kubera the, in the pantheon of gods, the, in the pantheon of Puranic gods, the Vaishravana is related to Kubera. Therefore, in a way, it is to Lord Vaishravana. And uh, that is generally used for Harati. You think it is given to Ganesha because you find Ganesha Murti there. It is given to Dakshina Murti also, not only Ganesha. Why you say Ganesha? Why not Dakshina Murti? Because the same Harati, Dakshina Murti. If you go to Durga temple, same Harati. Harati means that mantra. That is how it is used. Therefore, nothing particular about Ganesha Harati. What is the relation there? There is no relation. The relation is this much. Harati, wherever, whichever temple, Harati, with Raja Dhirajaya Mantra. That is the relation. Now, why is that relation is a different question. Therefore, there is no particular relation to Ganesha. The prayer is part of which Veda, Yajur Veda. Back home, we recite it as Mantra Puspanjali after every arati, but do not know meaning or origin. Origin is Yajur Veda. Sometimes it is recited as Mantra Puspanjali. That is correct. In fact, <laughs> even I used to do it as Mantra Puspanjali only. Uh, Raja Adhirajaya comes in Mantra Puspa. Mantra Puspa is a, quite a few mantras are uh, put together. And one of them is this. Uh, now that you say, I remember from our young days, childhood days, we used to recite it in the Mantra Pushpa, not in the Harati. Harati is some other mantra. But these customs vary, these are all customs. Custom means a practice. That is the custom. Right? Custom. 
ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ తైత్రీ ఉపనిషత్ ఇట్ ఈస్ మహానారాయణ ఉపనిషత్ ద నెక్స్ట్ చాప్టర్ ఎయిటీ సెకండ్ చాప్టర్ తైత్రీ ఐ ఇస్ సెవెంటీ నైన్ ఎయిటీ ఎయిటీ వన్ దిస్ ఈజ్ ఎయిటీ సెకండ్ చాప్టర్ నాట్ ఇన్ తైత్రీయ నాట్ ఇన్ తైత్రీయ ఉపనిషత్ పార్ట్ ఆఫ్ తైత్రీయ ఆరణ్యకం అండ్ సో ది కస్టమ్స్ చేంజ్ అండ్ దేర్ ఫోర్ ఇన్ ఐఎమ్ నాట్ ష్యూర్ వెదర్ ఆల్ త్రూ ది కంట్రీ ఇట్ ఈస్ యూస్డ్ ఎస్ హారతి ఇన్ టెంపుల్స్ ఇన్ సర్టన్ ప్లేసెస్ ఇట్ ఈస్ యూస్డ్ అండ్ అవర్ టెంపుల్ ఈజ్ వన్ సచ్ ప్లేస్ ఇట్స్ ఎ కస్టమ్ ది మంత్రా కెన్ బి యూస్డ్ ఫర్ పుష్పాంజలి ఆల్సో మంత్ర పుష్పం they follow one after the other harati and mantra pushpa so either used here or used there it can fit either way now meaning meaning is not difficult you go to our book ho book store it's a, it's a long mantra you know you want me to give meaning all of it now we'll wait i would recommend you go to our book store there is a book printed by ramakrishna mission called mahanarayana upanishad this is a book this is a book and in that you find the mantra and all meaning is given it's a standard book i know that book so you may refer to that <coughs> jivan mukta what is the need of vidvat sanyasa as he is already a renunciate from within no need a jivan mukta need not take to sanyasa this aspect who takes to sanyasa who should take to sanyasa who need not take to sanyasa being a jivan mukta when he is likely to take to sanyasa being a jivan mukta when he is likely to remain in his family life only all these aspects are discussed in the 5th chapter of gita but you cannot make one thing out of it without shankar bhashya you should have shankar bhashya before you with avatarika and carefully study avatarika and then shloka and bhashya every one of these questions are answered there and uh, it is only one question which is raised and i am answering it namely if he is a jivan mukta that is the main goal he is jivan mukta now you see there is a person who is perfectly healthy not likely to become sick now will he take the insurance or not sometimes he may take in a different context one may not take so suppose all his family members they put him into the group and push him into the insurance then they have money so what is there to stop okay let it be done so he gets insurance in a situ- in another situation very similar person he may not have enough money to spend on insurance or whatever the context he won't take it is like that the jivan mukta is there he is in the family life some people do not fit in family life they just don't fit and uh, you push into the family life they can they, they are like fish out of water there and they come back again before coming here i pushed a person to his wife and child he has a wife and daughter i pushed the person to them he came out of there i pushed him there i admonished and um, and uh, gave a strict warning go back live with your wife and child do this do that like that and i came here and then i got the within two months again he came out and then he wrote to me this big letter from that i can understand that this poor person i have unnecessarily pushed him into it he doesn't fit there he may not be jeevan mukta but he doesn't fit in family life some people are like that they don't fit in family life they may be not they may not be jeevan muktas so in india they want to run away or any sit to take to sanyas 
there is a, some security also in taking to sannyas. So you go food he needs are taken care, more or less. More or less. Earlier it was different, now it is somewhat different. More or less, with some difficulty you can manage. Occasionally you can get some from some hotel, this and that. Or put a few things at home, some oatmeal, this and that. So you can manage. Therefore they take to Kashaya. Sometimes people like me advise also. Why you struggle like that? Put on Kashaya. So that your life becomes easy for you. Because people, Indian society is like that. In a different society it may not work. Suppose in Europe if you take Kashaya, nobody will give food to you. Probably. But in India you take to Kashaya, you are better off. <laughs> that culture is different. Therefore, there is no rule that a Jeevan Mukta should take to Sanyasa. If he can fit in the samsara, he will remain in the samsara. He doesn't remain in the samsara, he will remain in the family. Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa did not take to sannyasa. He remained in the, at home. And he died at home. Um, Nisargadatta Maharaj did not take to sannyas. Uh, but uh, his wife died much early. Uh, a Jeevan Mukta will not marry a second time. That much I can tell you. Because that, that is an aberration. And uh, so he remained at home. And whatever he was doing, he continued to do. Ramana Maharshi, he never married. At the same time, he did not take to sannyasa also. He just remained as he is. He was a brahmachari. And he remained a brahmachari all his life. He did not to, take to the sannyasa. Uh, and uh, Vivekananda took to sannyasa. Uh, Ramatirtha took sannyasa. He was a married man, but took sannyasa. Like that. Akhandananda Maharaj is, of course, a sannyasi. He was also a married person, but took to sannyasa. Like that. So you cannot form any rule. There is a verse about it. The verse is something like, Krishno bhogi shukas tyagi nrupau janaka raghavau gruhinaha vasishthadhyaha sarvete jnanina samaha. That is the verse. I don't remember the source, but it's a good verse. So all jnanis, jivan muktas. Sri Krishna apparently lived a happy life, family life. Shuka, he is a renunciate, he is a mendicant. Shuka Stiyagi, Janaka and Sri Rama are kings, practicing kings, active, very busy kings like Narendra Modi. Narendra Modi is also a sannyasi, but a king. King like in modern days. Then uh, uh, what else? Vasishtha, etc. They are family people, married people, having children also. But all are jnanis, like that. What is Raja Yoga and Kriya Yoga? Patanjali's system of yoga is called Raja Yoga in a given context. It is called like that. But then uh, Shankaracharya in Aparokshanubhuti talks of Raja Yoga. The expression Raja Yoga is used by Shankara only in Aparokshanubhuti. You can refer to it. You will find verses on it. And uh, there he calls it Yoganam Raja. Raja Yoga. That is a samasa. Raja Danta Divata. Dantanam Raja. Normal samasa should be danta raja, but no, it is raja danta. Similarly, yoga nam raja, normal samasa should be yoga raja. No, raja yoga. So, yogi raja is also there. That is yogi raja, not yoga raja. Yoga raja will not be there, raja yoga. Means, there are yogas, means many pursuits. Yoga is many pursuits. 
Among them, this is the supreme. In that sense, the word Raja Yoga is used by Shankara, if I remember correctly, in Aparokshanubhuti text. You may refer to it. Kriya Yoga. It is used by Patanjali and he defined it. Patanjali's Yoga Sutras have four padas. Pada is a section. The second pada is called Sadhana pada. The very first sutra defines Kriya Yoga. Tapasvadhyā yeshvara pranidhānāni Kriya Yoga ha that is the sutra. I remember it vividly because in the recently concluded Yoga and Sound Retreat, the topic was the first ten sutras of Sadhana Pada. And this is the first sutra I was teaching here. Therefore it was in my mind. Of course I read it earlier also, I had that in my mind. So that is Kriya Yoga, defined by Patanjali. He used the term and he defined it. Nobody used it, nobody else used it. Sri Krishna or Shankara, they did not use it. Whereas Raja Yoga is used by um, Raja Vidya, Raja Guhya by Sri Krishna, but not Raja Yoga. Raja Vidya, he said, Vidya Nam Raja. Raja Guhya, Guhya Nam Raja. They were used by Sri Krishna. Raja Yoga is used by Shankara. Yoga Nam Raja. Whereas Kriya Yoga only by Patanjali. And then, in recent times, one Mahatma from Madhya Pradesh, Swami Muktananda, or some such Mahatma, I do not remember, Paramahamsa Yogananda, uh, Paramahamsa Yogananda, he took that name to his group or to his system of teaching. He called it Kriya Yoga. What he calls Kriya Yoga is not Patanjali's Kriya Yoga. His teaching, he has established and developed a particular teaching of his own. Of course, adopting from Patanjali and other places, he, he gave a kind of a trademark name, it is a brand name. He called it Kriya Yoga. Therefore, one should not confuse this name Kriya Yoga with that definition of Patanjali. They are two different things. Vivekananda Raja Yoga is about Patanjali's yoga system. Vivekananda wrote a book, a commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutras with a big introduction. And the, he named that book Raja Yoga. That is the only book written by Vivekananda sitting at a desk with pen and paper. Only one book. That is Raja Yoga. The rest of literature is the transcription of his teachings. If you have a passion to help poor people, is it still rajas? If you have a passion, it is rajas. If you spontaneously help, then it is sattva. If you have a passion to help, then it is rajas. Of course, it depends upon the word passion. So, uh, passion means uh, without it uh, you will not be comfortable. You have to find some poor people and help them. Then only you will be comfortable. Otherwise you will be very uncomfortable. If that is what you are talking about, then that is rajas. But suppose you say so much love to help, that is not rajas, that is sattva. And uh, you expect something from service, then that is rajas. You don't expect anything from service, then it is sattva, like that. The passion is a, is a very doubtful word because we use it in a negative sense. We say you should develop dispassion. That's why the word passion is a problem. Unless you use it in a particular sense and specify the sense, then it is alright. How Agama Pramana is different from other Pramanas? You see, what, what do you mean by that? They are different Pramanas. They are not the same Pramanas. 
लाइक लाइक यू आंसर मी दिस क्वेश्चन हाऊ आई साइट इज डिफरंट फ्रॉम हिअरिंग विटल मी बोल बोल हाऊ आई साइट इज डिफरंट फ्रॉम हिअरिंग हे म्हणले आय साइट इज यू सी हिअरिंग इज यू हिअर सो सिमिलरली प्रत्यक्ष प्रमाण इज मेंट फॉर नोईंग थिंग्स विथ आई सी इयर्स एक्सेट्रा अनुमान प्रमाण इज अज अ वे ऑफ नोईंग थिंग्स बाय इन्फरन्स शब्द प्रमाण इज अ वे ऑफ नोईंग थिंग्स फ्रॉम द शास्त्र by their very nature they are different you know like that now what i was avoiding till now it has come now avoiding means i have put it aside now how long can i put aside up to a point and then you have to deal with it so the two wives thing is settled okay we'll come to it <laughs> strongly feel india has done a great injustice to lord buddha whose message was not correctly interpreted interpreted by the contemporary hindus so called religious leaders and thereby missed buddha's vast stream of knowledge vast treasure of knowledge it is a very meaningful statement very correct statement the religious leaders of india the hindu religious leaders a few of them paid glorious tributes to buddha and pointed out that buddha's teaching is not opposed to vedic wisdom or vedantic wisdom it runs parallel to vedantic wisdom and therefore the these mahatmas the religious heads should make that point known to people uh, so that uh, but these religious heads say they do have a ill informed bias or even hostility towards the teaching of buddha i have seen it it is wrong they are ill informed and uh, they are doing an injustice to hindu dharma by trying to uh, trying to separate buddhism and buddha's teachings from hindu dharma hindu dharma it, it is like a canopy under which many streams of thought are included that is hindu and uh, in that uh, situation if that is what is hindu, what hindu means then you just push buddha aside that is the worst thing to do and it is done and the first person to raise his voice against this historic mistake is not that one person has done that but it's a historic blunder they happen in the lives of societies and countries they happen and the first person who bluntly pointed out this aspect is vivekananda he said that india lost heavily when buddhism left the shores of india and went to other countries he said a lot about it not a little a lot he said and that is one aspect of vivekananda's teaching which stands out he know how nicely he reconciles buddhism and hinduism and points out that they should merge there is no reason to remain as if they are hostile religions they are not within hinduism there is vaishnavism there is shaivism they fight with each other within the same hinduism vaishnavism and shaivism can remain under the same hinduism then buddhism why should it walk away it should not anyway so i among one i strongly feel in favor of buddhism because i studied it not because uh, i have some fad or fancy about it having studied 
in modern times after vivekananda if there is one sanyasi who has uh, compared uh, buddha's teachings word by word they are available not buddhism buddha's teachings the sermons it is like you go to vatican and try to understand christianity you get a different christianity which you may not agree with don't do that just open the bible new testament not old new testament and read these sermons sermon on the mount sermon in the garden some garden is there some particular name eh? ah there yeah, some that that garden and a sermon on olive mount something like that this mount that mount like the sermons those sermons are recorded and they are available in bible you read them they will be between inverted commas means they are the speech given by christ so you read them you are reading pure vedanta now you are not reading the samadhar religion so much so kudos to these great mahatmas like malayala swami in andhra pradesh in his ashram the symbol he put christ uh, cross it is a hindu ashram he puts a christ cross potapatte sai baba in his symbol puts a christ cross because uh, they don't go to vatican and all that that catholic and all that they don't bother about catholic protestant they don't bother about all that they look at these sermons and they are inspired so much so swami prabhavananda the head of ramakrishna mission in california he wrote a book on sermon on the mount that is his book by swami prabhavananda not by any bishop or anything and in modern times so this is what i was saying buddha's teachings like christ teachings are available as sermons with the same nomenclature buddha's sermons they are there you can read them the book is there they are all collected sermon in saranath sermon in jetavana in today's class i told one buddha story that came from the sermon in jetavana sermon in shravasti like that you have sermons with interesting names and take those sermons and take vedanta upanishads they sound very similar so much so in modern times it is the glory of swami ranganathananda you must be knowing the name who wrote in his message of upanishads especially ken upanishad that upanishad etc they read they make a marvelous reading the, those those uh, sections by swami ranganathananda uh, for ken upanishad his insights are uh, tremendous and marvelous if you read he he brings the vision of uh, buddha and compares it to the atma description in the upanishads and he nicely reconciles them they run very close to each other <clears throat> i quote the law of impermanence of forms i was talking about in the in this course or in other course law of impermanence of forms by buddha uh, so that uh, nicely coincides with the vedantic version so like that this uh, statement is very well said this gentleman i know him he said it very true every word of it is very true uh if you could comment your views yeah i commented my views just one more thing this point is not that i only notice that only ranganathananda notice that only vivekananda notice it is not like that many scholars and uh, many thinkers philosophers in india uh, they are aware of that and uh, taking uh, these messages and putting them together they are trying uh, to establish a beautiful connection between 
Hindus of India and Buddhists of Bhutan, China and Japan. So that there can be a wonderful uh, rapport between these communities in the Asian continent. And like that, that it is nothing to do with the government. It is people-to-people interaction. Especially on the basis of common philosophy uh, of Hinduism and Buddhism. Such efforts are going on. On a big scale they are going on. And uh, you will soon find a time when uh, Japan, China, uh, Vietnam, uh, Bhutan is already very close friend of India. Of course because of the proximity and uh, such good Thailand, Cambodia. India has very powerful, strong relations with Thailand and Cambodia. Uh, under Vietnam it has to happen. Vietnam was in the grip of communism. Therefore, this kind of relation cannot happen, could not happen all those years. But now communism has slowly vanished and so they are coming together now. Mainly Japan and India have come together. Narendra Modi has made a wonderful progress in that regard. He uses this point also, what I said just now, or what is said here. And with China, he is trying to stop. Culture-wise, China and India are very close, but they have border dispute and a bad history of Chinese aggression and all that. Uh, Therefore, the historic blunder of pushing away Buddhism blunder in which Buddhism left the shores of India. I don't say push away. In India nobody pushes away anybody else. It's a Sarva Dharma Samabhava. Most inclusive society at all times. Therefore nobody will push away but the Buddhism left the shores of India uh, for uh, some wrong understanding. So this historic blunder or historic misfortune there is a huge effort going on to correct that blunder. It will take a few decades to correct. So hopefully one day both will come together. Is that so? Buddha? Yeah. Any avatar, only after death. Any avatar. Historic, I mean, not mythological. The genius of the culture, yeah. and uh, therefore historic, Buddha, Rama and Krishna historic, and um, Lucian Heights, etc. are mythology. You are saying something, sir? Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It did not find uh, it did not find favor in the society, and therefore it left the shores. Whereas under Ashoka's uh, rule, he sent uh, missionaries uh, to other countries, Sinhala, there is Sri Lanka, etc., to Vietnam, Thailand. He sent missionaries, and therefore it spread in those countries. Within India, it did not find favor. It was uh, flourishing for a while and then disappeared. Now it is coming back in a way. Uh, Ambedkar brought it back in a way, on a mass scale. Before Ambedkar, uh, almost it was not there. Not much. Not worth mentioning. It's okay. Whatever may be the reason, there is certain percentage of Buddhists because of Ambedkar's movement. Buddha is one of the ten. Uh, of Vishnu only. Hmm. Dashavatara of Vishnu only. There is no other Dashavatara, only one Dashavatara of Vishnu. No, but I, some version of Dashavatara, 
it is not there. In Samdarshan it is not there. Because what happened is uh, they have three Ramas. Parashurama, Sri Rama, Balarama. There are Balarama Bhaktas. So they have pushed Buddha as I said, pushed Rama, Balarama. <laughs> yeah. So some, some avatar of politics it is. Yeah. There are stories, as he rightly said, that Shankara pushed away Buddhism from India. These are only stories. They are not real. So, what happened is, like stories about Puttapati Baba or Shirdi Baba, there are always stories about Babas and Godmen. Even while they are living, they spread stories. And the moment they disappear from the scene, now it is free for all. All stories can go on. So, like this it happens. And uh, Shankara, uh, Shankara like Christ, Christ of the sermons and the Christ of the church, they are not the same Christ. Somehow they are different. Or to put it, uh, that is not the right way to put it. The right way to put it is, the kind of ethos which Christ has taught, and the kind of ethos that the Christianity in the name of Christ embraces, there is a gap. There are variations and differences. It applies to Krishna. Same thing. Sri Krishna it applies. In no, I mean in the case of Sri Krishna, the differences and deviations are the worst. They are not so bad in the case of Christ. It applies to Buddha. Buddha says something, Buddhism is something else. Buddhism has four branches. Buddha cannot say four different things, you know. He must have said one thing. <laughs> and then it applies to Shankara in such a big way. The what Shankara says in Bhashyas and what Shankara that we adopt in temple, there are temples for Shankara. Can you believe it? Temple for Shankara. So, once you made a temple for Shankara, uh, that is the, that is a, not a very happy development. So, the, the gulf develops. Therefore, the stories about Shankara are all wrong stories. Wrong means you should not take them literally. And there cannot be any symbolism also. What symbolism? They are recent stories came in medieval periods. And uh, as he, as the, this gentleman pointed out, there was uh, some hostility against Buddhism in uh, Mimamsakas, Karma Mimamsakas. And this Karma Mimamsakas, they took Shankara and uh, made a caricature of Shankara. You know caricature? Huh? Caricature. It doesn't resemble the original Shankara, but somehow it is a, a distortion of the original Shankara. They made a caricature of Shankara. Uh, means they have totally distorted Shankara. And the Karma Mimamsakas hate Buddha. They hate, outright they hate. And therefore they portrayed Shankara in their vision. And in their stories, Shankara hates Buddha. Shankara defeats Buddha and all that. Not Buddha, Buddhism. This is how the stories have come. Shankara refuted Buddhism, the Kshanika Vijnanavada school, only in certain respects. And if you take Mandukya, Karikas and Shankara Bhashya, uh, if you take away the first portion and the last portion, if you look at the middle portion, Shankara and Kshanika Vijnanavada of the Buddhas, they run parallel, almost identical. 
Therefore, Shankara did not uh, throw away Buddhism. It is the caricature of Shankara as prepared by the Mimamsakas later that is supposed to have thrown away Shankara or Buddhism from India. Did I use the word caricature correctly? I think so. Huh? Yeah. So, this is how the stories go. Uh, that is, the, the story is created by the Mimamsakas, Karma Mimamsakas, correct? Yeah, they, they, they planted a story also. Because on one side hating Buddha, Buddhism, and on the other side saying Buddha is the Vishnu Avatara, this dichotomy they have to settle. They settled by inventing a story. Enough for this day. We look at it. Christ also? You see, I know. you see how magnanimous they are. Not, not only Ramakrishna Mishra, they are Hindus, Hindu Mathadipatis and Pithadipatis. They are so inclusive, they put a cross in their symbol. Put Om and a cross. You see their big heart, I, I, I really appreciate it. I found such a magnanimity in this country in Unitary Church. Uh, they are uh, very magnanimous, or oh, lovable people. Vivekananda, yeah. Unitarian Church people, they are amazing people. Once I spoke from a pulpit. <laughs> that is not Unitarian Church, that is regular Church. But still, they have invited me and I spoke from the pulpit. They took me to the pulpit. Pulpit is supposed to be occupied by a bishop or whatever. <laughs> ah, I know. They are marvelous people. And uh, I gave a series of lectures in many Unitarian churches. Not one time, multiple times. God bless. Hari Om Tatsa. Sri Krishna.